What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing more properties like this being built in front of a house. It's going to be torn down soon. I understand that there are power lines that are just kind of close. What's up again? This is Dan Fradenberg, and that there is a commercial real estate building. I'm joined today with Frank. Is it uh, Padalano? Is that how you pronounce it? Yes, it that? is. Yes. All right. Phonetics, phonics for the win. And you in the audience, if you've never seen a chance encounter before, this is how it works. I interview, I interview the commercial real estate investors in my circle and I ask them, okay, there are five different motivations I've found that people have for getting their next commercial property. Which one best describes you? And then I go through my Dan Does Deals commercial deal role die and there are only six sides and i say okay here's each of them which one's your core competency that you're most likely to contribute to your next commercial deal but if you're going to be successful in this industry or any industry really you have to be effective at introducing yourself so frank can you please introduce yourself for the audience sure uh frank padalano i'm out of rhode island uh, former school teacher who uh started buying more and more real estate and i uh, was able to quit my job and just hang out and do what I want every day, which is really awesome. Exactly, they live in the dream, that's the way it goes. So let's start off with the motivation piece. And to do that, I need to click this, and then I need to click that, and then I need to hit this. And ta-da, why do you want part of a commercial property? So I start off with these motivations because sometimes newbies are on the show, they don't have a real way to effectively communicate uh, what they're planning on doing, but at least they know the motivation. So I go through these first. And uh, the first one is preserving purchasing power. What does that mean? If you depend on your wealth and the income from that wealth to make ends meet, then your big concern is inflation basically ruining the party. So you have to keep on doing more acquisitions so you get an increased cash flow. So that is like your family offices and those uh, types of entities that are uh, really motivated by this one. The next one is my one, which is as a high earner from tech, I have the option of making a big fat salary th through wages and then giving half of it to the government in the form of income tax and then shooing away what's left, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. Maybe I'm odd. But, <laughs> but anyway, what I figured is, hey, if I pivot and I'm going directly into these uh, commercial deals on the GP team, then I'm getting rewarded for my time and effort in the form of wealth, which is better. The next reason is the most popular one, which is fast tracking retirement. There are a couple things that are implied when you say fast tracking retirement though. One is that there's an end in sight where you know maybe you only wanna work like one day a week or one day a month or one day a quarter or something like that, but you, you do wanna you know scale it down eventually. And that's in stark contrast to the next group they're so ambitious they want to buy their entire hometown they're going to keep on hustling into their 90s they're never ever going to stop they're handy people to have but you know you know what their uh, their main ambition is you know generational wealth they want to make sure that their great grandkids never have to get a day job you know that's basically what's going on here and then the last motivation is some people choose a sector of society maybe it's the environment maybe it's animals something like that and they say okay, the best vehicle out there for me to make a real impact in society is by accumulating wealth. And then I can just put it in my will and then, you know, maybe build a hospital for my community, you know, make a big, big, big impact. And so that's why they're getting into these commercial properties. So Frank, out of those five, uh, which of those resonate with you? Which ones describe you uh, in a decent manner? What, what's, um, what, which one's you? So I'm leaning towards the first one or two, uh, I'm already semi-retired anyway. My main goal is to uh, have my money work harder than I do. It's a beautiful, yeah. beautiful thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful I, thing. I don't mind hustling here or there. Um, sometimes you have to get a deal done, but I, I definitely don't want that to be my life either. Uh, I, do, I do have friends that love work, and they love working 24-7. That's not me. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, that's the thing too. I don't think you can surround yourself with people who are just like hustling 24 seven. I think that, you know, like they're probably giving up some of their relationship with their families and, and you know, the other things that make a lot more sense, they're, they're a lot more important long-term than just like, okay, am I worth 5 million or am I worth 10 million? You know, it's like, like where, like, where does it all, you know? I would say that there were spots in my life. I might've been like that, you know, a little, young spots like three months here or six months there more when i was in my late 20s versus now right right yeah i love that so now also for those uh in the audience if you don't have a whole lot of background in commercial real estate you're still trying to learn the ropes then this is going to be the part that's going to get you the most excited and it's the six different roles you can go to dandoesdeals.com download your own copy print it out you can discuss it with your family and friends and this way you can effectively communicate on the subject of commercial real estate so let's go through these six roles the first one is the repositioner a repositioner looks at a whole bunch of different properties and they do something they use a big word they call it underwriting. It just means they're doing the arithmetic. They're doing the math. They're saying, is this business actually making what the seller says it is? And the other thing that they're looking for is they got some tools up their sleeve to find upside. How do you get upside from a property? Well, the two main tools are more efficient operations. That's the first one. You stop those Benjamins from going down the toilet. And there's more to operations than just unclogging toilets, collecting rent, mowing lawns, stuff like that. There's also, uh, you know, making sure that the vacancy rate stays is low so you know if you're a marketer like I am then that means that uh, your operations are very handy and then there's automation which is the other computer side of things that I'm up to as far as contributing to the GP team but uh, efficient operations that's a great way to increase the value of the property but right now real estate's so hot that's probably not going to be enough so the other tool that repositioners generally have is they get a contractor team so they make the place nicer so they can charge more in rent that is what upside really is so so the contractor team, the, the, is, uh, the repositioner finds the contractor team, the repositioner finds the operations team. But if you're like me and you're from the internet, you got a big fat problem, which is you're going to need a local. Okay, I'm not even going to be finding my passport in an hour or two. So we need to have somebody who can drop by on a moment's notice. And their job is also to make sure that the operations team, they're actually doing their job and they're not faking the photos or whatever that they're sending to Mr. Internet here. And same with the contractors, making sure that they're not cutting corners and that they're keeping the schedule. But if you're a tenant, you probably hear these four and you're like, okay, well, those are the owners. But of course, there's more to it than that. Big one is the financier, the capital raisers, the banks, all that kind of stuff. The financiers, that's who the repositioner is going to, to say, hey, I want to buy a building and it's worth tens of millions of dollars. So can you lend me, say, tens of millions of dollars? And what they're going to do is they're going to look at the property. They're going to look at your team and say, okay, well, that's all well and good. But they're going to ask you, who's your sponsor? And if you're in most coaching programs, this is the part that they kind of skip over a little bit. And so as far as what a sponsor is, it's somebody who already owns a similar asset and you have to have them on the team or else you won't be eligible for the loan. So that's right. Even if you're Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, if you want to buy like a 350 unit apartment complex and you want to get a loan, you have to have a sponsor on the team who already owns a similar asset. You also have to have a certain amount of liquidity on hand and you also have to have a balance sheet of at least the amount of the loan. But if you've got all of those, you've got yourself a commercial real estate deal. So Frank, as far as core competencies go and what you'd be uh, likely to com uh, uh, contribute, contribute to the next uh, deal, uh, what are your core competencies that you'd be bringing along most likely? And number one, I love your massive die. That was pretty awesome. That really broke it down. Uh, I am definitely the uh, KP sponsor uh, or financier of, of the deal. Uh, usually they bring me in as the closer. Uh, I end up I end up being in deals that are falling apart, mo mostly because the GP team is falling apart. Uh, they're not raising well enough. And my job is to bring enough money and find enough friends to bring to the table to make it happen. You know, so uh, you want me to give a recent example or anything? Or? Yeah, sure, if you want to, go ahead. Yeah, so you actually know about this deal. It was a deal in Texas. And uh, before there was GP team 1.0 that got through the LOI, GP 2.0, they couldn't get through the financing. And I was basically a part of GP 3.0 that they brought me in to save the deal. And um, I said, well, how much do you have raised? And they really didn't have a lot. They had soft commitments, but we know that's as good as toilet paper. Mm. So uh, we basically had to raise 1.9 million and um, I had less than two months to do it. 
after they've already done extensions and everything else. So it's like, no, no, this is the drop dead date and we are closing no matter what. So uh, I had to uh, call around and uh, we raised enough money to get it done. I ended up putting uh, almost $600,000 on my own cash into the deal to make sure the deal closed no matter what on time. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So it just goes to show that it's it's so much more of a balancing act than, you know, like, what do you want to call it? Optimistic coaches might make it sound. <laughs> it's it's pretty brutal. But uh, the next question I have for you is as far as ideal properties, uh, my buzzword I like to use for that is your buy box. And what it means is it's what's the geography? Okay, so what states, things like that, what cities uh, are particularly appealing, the unit count of the property that you like and the class, that's the buy box as a whole. So Frank, for you, what property uh, details make it easier to say yes and more difficult to say no? Sure. So number one, I am not looking at super hot markets. So I saw a Yardi index of the top five uh, places to invest, which were Houston, Dallas, Miami, Phoenix. And I don't remember what the fifth one was, but I'm not looking in those areas. I'm looking in um, secondary and mostly tertiary markets. Uh, I like that BC borderline something that I can get that C right over to a B class. Uh, number of units, uh, my typical is 50 to 150, uh, nothing crazy. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm invested as an LP in about nine or 10 deals. Those are deals that uh, I'm either trying to build a relationship with the GP team or deals that just don't always meet my wheelhouse of, um, of places or, or size, you know, but that's basically what I'm looking for. Okay, that's beautiful. And uh, so we ended up uh, coming into contact with each other through LinkedIn. Is is LinkedIn the best way to reach out to you? Or is there a website that's better or something like that? Uh, we have uh, about 14,000 um, followers on Instagram mm -hmm. uh, through the Cashflow Kings. I got my brand right behind me. Uh, I am on LinkedIn. It's a, it is a way to connect. But it's funny because uh, you were talking about you know, 506C, 506B, and with a 506C, we got most of our investors through Instagram the last time. People don't think there's accredited investors on Instagram. There definitely are. Yeah, yeah. I hear similar things about TikTok. Uh, I'm friends with the TikTok lawyers. Uh, they were able to get over 22,000 followers in two months. So like there's really, really a lot of opportunity there. You know, me being from a tech background, you know, like I have to focus on the social media thing. I, I, I do a lot of YouTube as well. Yeah, nice, nice. We we um we have our brand on TikTok, but we don't do much with it. We just are basically holding it there. And mm -hmm. I'm not dancing and I don't really talk with the little do 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 but stuff like that. Instagram's easier for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So I got to reach out on that uh, a little bit more. If you don't know me, I've already said a few uh, different things about myself. But yeah, my background is I used to work for a CRM company. It was web.com and it was their shopping cart ring. So I ended up doing all sorts of e-commerce for different seven-figure online businesses. And as you're going to bigger and better clients, all roads do lead to real estate. So I was working with a real estate company for about six years before branching out into commercial real estate myself. So that's me. But I have a favor to ask you in the camera, which is if you notice under here, under my left hand, there's a red button and it's so sad. The only way to fix that awful red button is by clicking on it and then it turns gray. And that means that YouTube pays for these videos instead of me. So that's why you really want to do it. It costs you absolutely nothing. Please make that happen. Uh, Frank, I do have another question for you before we get going, which is um, because there are so many different facets to commercial real estate, everybody's well suited to help some people more than others, like some roles more than others. So as far as who you're on the lookout for, uh, you mentioned 506C, so that means it's perfectly fine to entice investors. If you're in a 506B deal, you can't do that. That's against the SEC restrictions. But uh, can you uh, describe the best person to reach out to you as far as like who you can help? Sure, um, I need expert underwriters, um, especially someone that is close to the asset. And they're finding deals that they can't, they just can't uh, pull off any other way. And that, that's how, uh, that's how I make uh, good relationships. All right. That's a beautiful thing. So please do hit that subscribe button. You've done me an enormous favor, just like Frank has done me an enormous fa favor for coming and joining me today. This has been fantastic getting to know you, Frank. Thank you, Dan. This is All awesome. Right. All right, thank you. I just wanted to tell you, because I've actually seen your website, Real Estate is a Scam, before, and I loved it. Oh, and, cool. Uh, so, uh, yeah, because I think it's really so spot on. There's good stuff, bad stuff in every industry. Yeah, make sure you subscribe, like, and hit that notification bell. For Dan the Man.
And thank you. Uh, turn that subscribe button uh, from red like his beard to gray like his beard will be. So I met Dan through some networking groups for real estate investing. Uh, he's a great guy from what I know about him. He's uh, very ambitious and he makes it easy to come on with his questions and has a great setup. It's easy, it's uh, clear, concise, and I'd recommend going on to his interviews for anyone that's considering it. Oh, it's, it was an unlike anything I've ever experienced. It was super fun. Um, the process was so easy a caveman can do it. I mean, if you guys haven't done it yet, you guys need to get on his calendar. Just take 15 minutes of your time, get exposure, find out who Dan is, what he's about. He's a true trifecta. Um, and if you don't know who he is, get in touch with him. Google his name, find him on LinkedIn, do whatever you can, just reach out to him. So I, I really appreciate the format. Uh, like like I've told you uh, a couple times before, I, I think it's, it's really great because uh, me personally, I'm very long-winded. Uh, I have to purposefully make things more concise, but the way I take things in is uh, I definitely prefer things to be concise and straight to the point and concentrated. And uh, the chance encounters really do that uh, great for individuals. So you can get a good grasp on who they are, what do they do, why do they do it, uh, what space they operate in. That's, that's why I love chance encounters.